All right, here, let me do this little about one minute preamble ramble here. Of the Downtown Memphis Commission is actually uh, sponsoring a grant that Willie can record all this and we can put it on the internet. Y'all know what the internet is, right? And anybody can access for free for any use they want to. We were allowed, we did this back uh, together in uh, February and March at the Pink Palace Museum. I had 12 PowerPoint lectures I did of different topics and he recorded them and touched them up post-production wise to make them look a little bit better, I guess. Uh, and all 12 of those are out on the internet now for free access or anybody use teachers, anybody. Um, if you, and the easiest way to get to it, I think, is Google four words, okay? Jimmy Ogle and Pink Palace. It, and not all one word, just you, as you, as you just randomly Google, do that. It's not a website or anything. And what will pop up and go Ogle, we say, not Google, is, um, well, that's somebody finally got it, right? Besides Willie, he's heard it 10 times. He finally started laughing. I'm suing those folks. You know. But uh, if you do that, you know, like storytelling from Pink Pilots. And there's 12 different 45 minute or so lectures, right, Willie, of yeah. PowerPoints and all these old pictures and very descriptive, like second time we've seen that clown. Yeah. I don't enjoy that. I hope y'all do, but I don't. It's kind of like those trucks, ice cream trucks in the parks. Yeah. Hello, hello. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay. Anyway. I was like a unicycle, electric unicycle or something. He wasn't even trying, was he? That's a some type of one-wheeled uh, deal. All right. So uh, we've done the last three days. We've done uh, the River Bluff Walk. We've done Cotton Row. We've done Pinch District. We've done Civic Center Plaza, Adams Avenue, the Union Avenue today. In May, we did uh, Court Square and Surroundings in South Main. So this will get us Beale Street. We'll go down to about Church Park, go back behind Beale Street, and come up Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. If you want to leave at any time, please leave this one. We'll probably go about 90 minutes total. We, some of us got to get out to Memphis Heritage at 3 o'clock today. 2282 Madison at Jefferson right before Parkway, the big Howard Hall. Uh, it's a Newman Denal reception. Open to the public if you want to come about all the Don Newman photographs. You know, and, and a lot of those great pictures you see like at the arcade restaurant and stuff. Don Newman, unlike Willie Bearden, had an 80-pound tripod. How much is that? Uh, maybe two. Two pounds. 25-pound <laughs> camera. This is in the 1940s and 50s when you see those great Don Newman pictures. Eight by 10 inch negative, little blanket, you know, probably wearing a suit and tie. Yeah, sure. When's the last time you wore a tie? Oh, boy. I don't know. Uh, taking all those great photos you see, and Gary Walpole has reproduced what's there now or not there now. We do it then and now, and then Emily Cohen got a grant that'll help uh, be, this, be in the schools as part of their arts curriculum next year, too. So that's kind of what we've been working together on. We did some videos describing the buildings with me and Gary and had a lot of fun doing that, so that's what we're doing at three. I'll probably come back in July to do a couple more walking tours like this, so stay in touch with jimmyogle.com website. Uh, I know I'm back July 27th, that's a Saturday, because we're doing three, uh, one walking tour of Elmwood and two PowerPoint presentations, nine o'clock in the morning, it's $20 each, it's a fundraiser for Elmwood. The west side of the uh, uh, cemetery, we had never done before. And then 11 o'clock, we're doing Cotton Men of Elmwood, a PowerPoint, great PowerPoint, and one o'clock, Historic Memphis Riverfront, okay? raising money for Elmwood there. So we might come back that week and do a few more tours. We haven't covered some areas in downtown. Again, this all be put together and be on some type of access for anybody forever and ever. And that's like, we appreciate it, me and Willie do, because the stuff we do, there's a resource there. Like in 1890, somebody took pictures of Cotton Row and Beale Street, and, and in 1930, somebody took somebody took pictures of South Main when Frank's Liquor Store was there, you know, and the old Green Beetle. And that's what we use in all our PowerPoints and stuff, you know. We use those resources, the public domain, the library. They got 10,000 images you can go. Dig Memphis, just put digital Memphis, just Google Dig Memphis. All of a sudden, you got access to a whole bunch of old photos. So we're snapshotting or digitizing here in Memphis in 2019 in that same spirit. So we'll have it 30 years from now, somebody, because now digitization is the way of the future rather than writing a book. If I wrote a book, it'd be one long run on sentence, wouldn't it? So, <laughs> and no respect to the Oxford comma either. So, so this is gonna be the Bill Street tour here. And, and, and another thing about my tours, if I can see it, I can talk about it, okay? My own self-governing rules, okay? And so we're actually gonna go down Bill Street, but since we're standing right here and we look down, partially down South Main, you look, this area of, of uh, Memphis started growing in the middle of the 
19th century, from 1844 to 1850, from where Union Avenue is, that was the original southern boundary of Memphis, to about where the train stations are now. That was called South Memphis from 1844 to 85, a whole separate town. And Bill Street was the main street. It went all the way down to the cobblestones, came up, down in this area here, through the Gayoso Bayou, about eight more blocks out to Hunt Phelan Home. You know, it was all commercial in there and everything. Uh, in early 1900, uh, Bill Street was, uh, this is a quote by Lieutenant George W. Lee, Bill Street was a mile of vice and commercial ambition owned by the Jews, policed by the whites, and enjoyed by the Negroes. Lieutenant George W. Lee Streets right over here is a black Republican operative of Robert Church Jr. during that time. Very powerful man, the mayor of Bill Street. So that's the quote. That's how it was in a segregated city. And because after the Civil War or during the Civil War, you had runaway slaves, free slaves, sharecroppers coming into Memphis, St. Louis, Chicago, Detroit for equal opportunity, coming up that Blues Highway with the music. We'll get into that later on. Uh, and Bill Street was uh, the melting pot there. After the yellow fever epidemic, we got through all that. 1880, we're down to 10,000 people. And by 1900, we had over 100,000 people in Memphis through the in-migration from the Delta and the immigration from Europe, the Jewish, the Italian, the Irish, the German, into Memphis. And between 1900 and 1910, less than 10 percent of the people actually living in Memphis were actually born in Memphis. That's what a melting pot we were 100 years ago. We've kind of always been that way up through uh, the early part of the 20th century. And then, of course, uh, desegregation comes in in the 50s and 60s and things start to change. We'll probably cover that later on. So quickly as we look down South Main here, this was all built up on the railroad economy between downtown Memphis and Union Station and Central Station built in 1912 and 1914. By the, uh, World War II there were 92 passenger trains a day coming into Memphis, these two train stations. Because uh, this is the crossroads right here in America, our location, you know. We're halfway between the Great Lakes and the Gulf of Mexico, the highest piece of ground, the Mississippi River. The first railroad to connect the Atlantic Ocean when the Mississippi River came from Charleston. That's a railroad track that all y'all love in East Memphis, right? Everybody loves it, gonna raise your hand, raise your right hand. Nobody but you loves it? I love East Memphis. And you love the railroad track in East Memphis? Southern is a freight Okay, well, do you love it? That's a yes or no question. She apparently does. So she done. Oh, no, we're off the tour. Let's go. All right, so this is a good time for everybody to raise your right hand anyway and take the staycation pledge. Is that okay, Willie? Yes, indeed. Are you going to repeat after me? I. I. Your name. Very good. Pledge to visit an attraction in Memphis, Tennessee. Raise your right hand that I've never visited before during the course of this summer. All right. Having, done such, Having done such, I will tell a friend. Tell a friend. Okay, you've taken the staycation pledge. Now, I promise you, your life will never be the same. I mean, I, I bet you all of y'all haven't been to Graceland. You'd be shocked how, what, what's happening there, what, how cool it is. Or, or Stax, or the Memphis Rock and Soul Museum, or the Cotton Museum, or uh, Slave Haven Burkle Estate up there, or the Victorian Village Houses, or God, the zoo. Uh, you know, the fire museum. I just think about all these places you can go to. Uh, everybody goes to the zoo. Everybody goes to Pink Pop. But there's all great. Belts Museum of Asian and Judaic Art. A private collection. So the objects are so big they had to put them in the basement because the floors couldn't handle the weight. You know? A rare collection. When, when Memphis and May honored China, the Chinese ambassador was over there and he kind of went, how'd you get that stuff out of China? <laughs> you know? Now, he didn't say it that way, but they were like, wow, they got some rare things from the Middle East. It's America. Can we, cut we love it. No, yeah. We, we just stopped talking. We would have to, yeah. But, all right. So, Hotel Chiska built in 1913. Uh, 1970s, it was bought for $10 from the Todd family by the Church of God in Christ. Uh, used for housing for a while, then laid fallow about 20 years. I was on a record ball 2011. It was one of five buildings in Memphis on the most endangered buildings list. Sears Cross Town. See what's happened there? Uh, Hotel Chiska, Tennessee Brewery, Claiborne Temple, and 19th Century Club, and all those made it. And this, remember, you look down the way, it was just windows boarded up, just dark. Oh, just, we're scared to go down that way. And look at the renewal now in, in South Maine. When I first lived down here in 1986 at the Paperworks, next door to me, I was the only person in the building at the time, next door to me was Self's Cricket Ranch. They were incubating 30 million crickets a year for, for zoos and bait shops around the country. Think about that. Uh, 
and now it's finally hit in there. You can't build apartments fast enough down this growth area down here. Memphis Light, Gas, and Water, the largest multi-purpose utility under one roof in America, three tenant. Uh, come on over here, Lillian. Come on, just stand right here with me for a second. It's okay, I can, is that your husband? That's my friend. Oh, you got a friend, you don't yeah, have a husband? Yeah. Oh, well, good. well, wait a minute, he came off the tour then. <laughs> I got the pleasure of meeting Lillian Johnson here, right? Yes. With the uh, communications department, Gail yes. Carson, Gail Jones Carson, Gail Carson Jones. Yes, my baby. Uh, back last year, we did a historical marker for Joseph C. Joe Warren out at a house at 968 Mar Street, M-E-A-G-H-E-R. Many people say meager, but the Irish pronunciation is a soft G, Mar. Out to buy the North Memphis MLG and GNW compound. Uh, one of the rare houses in Memphis that civil rights meetings were held. Most of the meetings were held in churches and in funeral homes because the whites wouldn't go there and intimidate them. This is in a house, and this is, uh, Mr. Warren allowed that to happen in his house, so they preserved the house, MLG and W did. This is Memphis. And uh, <clears throat> we, uh, Shelby County Historical Commission placed an historical marker out there last year, and she was very helpful in getting that done. And now we go right over here. Remember, Tri-State Bank used to be right over here, built in 1970, got torn down recently. They thought they were going to build a boutique hotel. That didn't happen. So we got a parking lot out of the deal. <clears throat> well, during that time, uh, there was a historical marker right on the edge of the building, School for Freedmen. If you remember back, uh, if you're reconstruction history here, uh, Schools for Freedmen, about nine of them in this area during the Civil War and afterwards, and we had the Memphis Massacre of 1866 or they call it the race ride of 1866, but it was a massacre. All the schools were burned. There was a marker over here that kind of told, kind of told the story. And then about two years ago, the Memphis massacre marker got put down, uh, down at Navy Park at Bishop G. Patterson and Second Street. This one was kind of hidden up in here. They tore the building down. They didn't tear down the marker. We saved it and went to my friend at MLG and W. And we're going to put it right over here on MLG and W property. Okay, and, and the hole's gonna be dug next week. We came over here last Wednesday to dig the hole, and the MLG and W guy said, "Hmm, we better call 811. Call yeah. before you dig." <laughs> I thought they'd already done that, so he's got the pole. We'll get it done. We won't. We won't. I wasn't gonna be here Wednesday and shut down all the power at MLG and W because I'm digging a hole in their lot with their guy. How bad would that be? So we'll get it put up, and we'll do a dedication later on this summer. Uh, but if you look around the Memphis Light, Gas, and Water campus, right down here at the corner, you got a Bobby Blue Bland statue, right? Bobby Blue Bland born in Bearville, around the very corner, about where that pink shirt is down there. Uh, you'll see Bobby Blue Bland, a great blues musician. That's up there on the southeast corner. We'll end up our tour today at the Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Reflection Park. Uh, and then you'll get over here in just a minute to Elvis Presley Plaza. Uh, this, by the way, MLG and W is the most photographed building in Memphis. How about that? It's the backdrop to the Elvis statue. So all those Europeans coming in, see? So they're the most photographed building here. So y'all get to touch her left shoulder too. Those y'all who touch, who touch Hal Lancey's left shoulder, you touch Lillian's left shoulder there because she's been very helpful and powerful. You know, and I, I get to fill in for Earl Farrell on a radio program sometimes, and I get their bosses come on, I get to ask them tough questions. But when you think about what Memphis Light, Gas, and Water does, you get, who gets a utility bill for Memphis Light, Gas, and Water? Well, there's more than just light, gas, and water on that bill. They're a collection agency for mosquito spray and how, what, how many other things? Four or five other things. So about two-thirds of your bill is actually light, gas, and water, and they're being the collection agency as well all around. And, of course, I got started doing uh, these tours by manhole covers, and we won't talk too much about manhole covers today, but uh, and about November the 6th, 1934 Street, too. We got a little... Thing going on about that. So, MLG and W. Orpheum Theater here, uh, the Grand Opera Hall was here. It burned down like in 1923, I believe, like from 1890 to 1923. 1923. 1923. Oh, it was a sister. $250,000. Same year, two months later, the Garage Chiska Hotel burned down with all the cars in it. It's another $250,000. There you go. 1930 or 1928 is when the Orpheum opened. Orpheum opens like in 1930, okay? <clears throat> As the Orpheum Theater, a vaudeville theater, uh, then later bought by the Malco M.A. Lightman Company. You know the Malco name. There was also in the 1920s uh, four other big movie theaters in downtown Memphis. Right here where the Peabody Place building is was the uh, Low State. Then you had the Strand. And then at Main and Monroe, you had the uh, Warner 
Theater and then at Union, where parking can be fun, is now you have the Lowe's Palace. This is the only one that has survived because when you get up through 1960s and 70s, you start having the multiplexes and the big movie houses go away. Uh, this was almost sold. Uh, this Malco offered this building to Memphis City of Memphis in 1976 for a hundred thousand dollars, and they turned it down. Too much upkeep. What are we gonna do? 1976, Peabody Hotel was closed. Uh, 1977 to 1983, Beale Street was fenced off during urban renewal years. We had 572 acres. Over 3,000 buildings were torn down during that time in the urban renewal. We called it urban removal. A lot of those areas are still vacant, you know. Uh, the Rainbow Tail closed. It was bought for $144,000 on the courthouse steps in 1982. Peabody bought for 540. So a group came together called Memphis Development Foundation. Uh, William Matthews, Lucia Gilliland, even Sybil Shepherd, she's in a star over here. And they bought the Orpheum Theater for $285,000 and started restoring it expanding it, 90s and all. They got all the big Broadway shows. Hired Pat Haller in there. That was a pretty, pretty good hire, you know. Uh, and uh, now we're one of the largest Broadway show houses. Look at here, Hamilton for three weeks in July uh, can accommodate it. And plus many other good shows. The $14 million Halloran Center opened a couple years ago. Smaller theater, about 285 or something like that uh, for smaller shows and, and other workshops and classes and education for youth. Uh, in theater production and things like so a lot of things can happen here at the Orpheum Theater where Broadway meets Beale is what we say is one of the terms you'll see and you'll see about 85 or so brass notes on the sidewalks here of various people over the years who perform at the Orpheum or the Grand Opera House uh, there's one over here for Helen Keller even you know go figure on that okay but um, a lot of Memphians you'll see in here or you'll see uh, I know three women from Memphis are in here Sybil Shepherd, Callan Asperian and Marguerite Piazza Okay, and they're on our Women's History Trail tour. But here's Mickey Rooney, B.B. King, Richard Harris. I guess he was for Camelot, right? <laughs> but Yul Brynner right there. David Copperfield, a musician. So our, our honor of stars are adding all the time. I think maybe Robert Plant was done not too long ago. I know that. Uh, he loves blues and all that. So the Orpheum Theater is just a great place. Let's walk over here. In fact, let's cross the street. We'll try to get in as much shade as we can. If y'all want to stand in the shade right there. A little shade right there if you want to stand in it. We're going to look back this way just for a second right here, okay? Yeah, okay, let's go this way. Let's go. All right, Bill Street went all the way down to the river, and many of the old steamboat captains in the 19th century hated coming up to Bill Street here because they'd been on the river like two or three weeks at a time, and nobody's seen booze or women or anything like that, you know. And deckhands have come up into Bill Street, and they might not ever return to the boat. They might get married, they might get kidnapped, they might get killed, they might just run away, you know. So it was a anything goes street right over here, and you hear about, read about the history of it. And all the way down to the cobblestones, there's an access to the cobblestones at that park that we covered up in 2002. Waterford Plaza came in 1983. That was the site of one of another train station, the Chesapeake, Ohio and Southwestern, up until the 1950s and 60s. You see the uh, AutoZone parking garage and AutoZone, it started in Memphis, not downtown, but it started in Memphis in 1979 as Auto Shack got sued by Radio Shack, had to change its name. There's 6,000 auto zones now and no radio shacks, okay? Uh, you see the Gaosa Hotel, the red brick building. That's the second version of the Gaosa Hotel. The first one uh, was in 18, like 1840s. Robertson Top, who developed Bill Street and named all these streets and, uh, back in the 19th century, built that hotel, but it burned down like in 1898 or 1899, so he built a second one right there. And that got all incorporated in the middle of the 20th century into all the Goldsmiths Empire. Anybody remember Goldsmiths? Okay. Uh, the Haverty building right here, Haverty Furniture, and right down at Main and Gayoso was where the Goldsmiths building, they started on Beale Street, moved over to where Jolly Royal is now, and then like in 1901, they moved across the street when they built that building in 1901. There's actually six different spaces they were selling, and Goldsmiths went into one and then expanded all into everything else. 
I worked there 1979. I worked on the loading dock over here at the Goldsmiths for $3.25 an hour, uh, taking boxes off the trucks. So there were four Goldsmiths in Memphis at the time. And I was living out at Winchester and Mendenhall, riding a bus in the downtown Memphis, getting off at the Peabody Hotel that was closed, walking up Main Street that was all closed, but Goldsmith somehow was still open during that time. And we were taking the products up to the third or fourth floor, opening the boxes up and putting the labels on them, then closing them back up and sending them out to the other three stores. My specialty was women's cosmetics, Clinique. I know how to spell Clinique, by the way. Uh, Goldsmiths was the first department store in Memphis with air conditioning and with an escalator as well over there. And of course, Peabody Place right here opened in 1998. Uh, Tri-State Bank was here up until a year ago. It was founded about 60, 80 years ago. Uh, a black-owned bank. They have relocated on out and this property became more valuable. I guess for our parking lot right now. We'll hope, hopefully it'll do better than that later on. Let's come on down here to Elvis Presley Plaza. All rise. If you see the L-O-C right here, that means locate. <laughs> so right, right there is we're going to put our pole. And we decided, nah, we're not going to dig a 39-inch hole until we get it sprayed. So it is very critical. 811, call before you dig, okay? Uh, and there's seven different colors. Y'all have seen this on the street before, right? They come out and spray for gas, water, light, telecommunications, all this stuff and the paint evaporates on out, but it's very critical to do that, okay? So we dig a 39 inch hole, put the pole in, a sack of sackcrete, let it set for a day, then put the marker on. We gotta make sure it's level too, back and forth, and that's fun. That's where School for Freedmen will go, right there, Lily and Wright, sometime next week, we hope. Okay, let's go on this way. Elvis Presley used to walk up and down Bill Street. He was drawn to that raw, gutsy sound of Bill Street, just like Sam Phillips was down in Handy Park in the clubs. Uh, so that's why we have Elvis Presley Plaza here. This is a second incarnation of the statue. The first, <clears throat> the first is down in the Tennessee Welcome Center, along with B.B. King. It just had too many things on it that could be stolen, <laughs> and people were picking them off, so we had to get it inside and secured. That's a vandal proof from stealing anything. You could probably spray paint it or something. That's kind of vandal proof right there, Elvis Presley. Uh, and we'll tell a story about Lansky Brothers uh, elsewhere. Right here is, you don't need to see the sign, the sign's missing, but this is where November the 6th, 1934 Street starts, okay? Right here, it goes 17 blocks, all the way to Shadiac Avenue in the pinch, and some buildings block it in between, as you gotta go, it's about 27 blocks to get the whole tour in. But uh, November the 6th, 1934 is the date when Memphis voted to join TVA Power. Tennessee Valley Authority power. During the Depression years, there was a Roosevelt Democratic uh, uh, New Deal program, let's say. Uh, and it was very controversial because it was bent. It was a rural power system, Tennessee Valley Authority. We're a large urban area drawing that power off. So by the 1950s, the Eisenhower Republican administration wanted to kick us off with the Yates Dixon Act. And so that's when we built the Allen Steam Plant. On, on President's Island down there to pick up our increased demand for utilities. We're still the largest customer of TVA at 11 or 10 or 11 percent. Now, the sign says November the 6th Street, the sign that's not there, and somehow it's gone now. Uh, and I've done a whole survey of missing signs in alleys in downtown Memphis that y'all got. So, uh, But I want to put 1934 back on the sign because, am I? Nobody can tell me different in the last 15 years. It's the only street in America named after a month, a day, and a year. November 6, 1934. There's not a July 4, 1776 street in Boston or Philadelphia for our independence. Uh, July 20th, 1969 for when we landed on the moon. But November the 6th, 1934 when Memphis voted to join TVA power. What? But it needs to be on there. We need to get it put it back on, don't we? Can we agree on that? Okay, well, I won't make you pledge to it either, okay? But uh, we want to get that put back on. And um, if you can say Charlie Vergus Rendezvous Alley on the sign, you can say 1934, November 6th, right? Okay, okay. Let's walk around on the other side of this bus. Now, we're going to talk about Lansky Brothers and about B.B. King, and then we're probably going to walk pretty far down Beale Street, maybe to about Silky's, because there's so much noise coming out of the speakers on Beale Street, you can't 
hear, okay? Or, does that make sense? You can't hear it, but you can't hear me. Yes. Okay, so let's go in front of the bus to get away from this sound here. All right, you look across the street, you got Lansky Brothers, Clother to the King. In 8, 1948, Lansky Brothers opened here on Beale Street. Uh, and he was selling Army surplus merchandise right after World War II. There were 92 passenger trains a day coming into Beale Street. I mean, coming into the train stations down here, about 10 miles, uh, 10 blocks south of us here. So all those World War II vets were coming in. Why not sell Army surplus merchandise? Then you get into the 1950s, and now the black and white kids are coming down into Beale Street for the music. Beale Street, for the whole first half of the century, had a wild reputation of music, drugs, crime, liquor, you name it, anything went on Beale Street. Rufus Thomas used to say, to the white people, if you were black for one night, for one Saturday night on Bill Street, you never want to be white again. You know, that was Rufus. And Rufus would say anything. I got to know Rufus. Rufus was the only uh, person that knew W.C. Handy. Rufus had the first hit at Sun Studio, and he and Carla had the first hit at Stax. And nobody can say that. Of course, we got a street name for him down here. We'll talk about him later on. So Lansky Brothers, Bernard King, Bernard King, Bernard Lansky started seeing all those kids coming in. So he went to the East Coast and West Coast and brought bright clothing to sell to those, those musicians because he knew that music was going to take off the rock and roll, the soul, rock and roll at Sun, soul at Stax. And those musicians were wearing the fancy clothing. Where'd you get that from? Lansky Brothers, you know. All the kids, you know, would want to buy that clothing or have the same hairstyle or whatever, right? True. True. Okay, true, not right, true. And so this is where it was until 1981. Elvis would walk up and down the street. And the story that, that Hal tells is uh, uh, he was looking in the window at the clothing. And Mr. Lancey said, come on in, son, and buy you some clothes. And, and Mr. Mr. Lancey said to Elvis, and Elvis said, well, Mr. Lancey, I don't got any money. But when I get some money, I'm going to buy you out. And Mr. Lancey said, don't worry about that, son, so long as you buy from me. You see, so he gave Elvis credit clothing, extended it to him, and then... Elvis did get popular in 1956, he comes in, Mr. Lansky, Mr. Lansky, I'm gonna be on a TV show. I need to get some clothes, but I got a problem. I don't got any money. Yeah, con man, right, okay. Uh, but he was gonna be on the Ed Sullivan Show, September 9th, 1956. So Mr. Lansky picked something out for him. They give him that all-American look. If you see the jacket he wears on September the 9th, 1956, it's a plaid jacket. It couldn't be any all, more all-American fraternity looking than that. Of course, they didn't show him from the waist down, you know. You go to Lansky Brothers over there in the Peabody, it's got a picture of him and Scotty Moore and Bill Black and DJ Fontana from the waist down, if you have to look, okay. Uh, and so he gave him the clothes. So Mr. Lansky's known as, known as Clother to the King. If Sam Phillips uh, began rock and roll at 706 Union Avenue, it was Mr. Lansky who put the clothes on rock and roll, they say. And all these other musicians came to him and got credit clothing, whether it's Jerry Lewis, Johnny Cash, David Porter, Rufus Thomas, B.B. King. You just look at all the guitars that are autographed over there of all the people who patronized the Lanskys over the years. They kept on coming back. And Boo Mitchell. And uh, uh, folks, they can pay for it to this day, too, you know. Uh, so that was a great thing right there at Lansky Brothers. In 1981, they moved over to the Peabody Hotel when it opened because this was all fenced off in here during urban renewal. The only businesses open were Hudkins Hardware and uh, A. Schwab. A. Schwab has this name on the back of the building. You had to enter from the alley. That's how you got in there, okay? Uh, it's been there since 18... It was actually over here in 1876, like where Blue City Cafe. They moved across the street like in 1911 or 1912 and then expanded in to the building to the east. That was an old Piggly Wiggly. Okay, later on, that got converted into the extra space for A. Schwab. Of course, everybody knows the story of Piggly Wiggly, right? 1916 in downtown Memphis, Maine and Jefferson. We changed the way the world shop for groceries. First self-service grocery store. Uh, so those two, the only things open until 1983. And then in 1983, uh, the city had gone through several schemes in the 1970s in the urban renewal phase to try to get Bill Street back open. A lot of these buildings had were been, were been empty for a while, had decayed, roofs had fallen in, they'd been vandalized, some had been burned. So they started kind of a homesteading program. You could buy a building for a dollar on Bill Street but you had to put all the money into it to restore it. So you had to spend several hundred thousand dollars fixing it up. One or two of those buildings actually happened that way. So it didn't succeed. So they went to a master developer, Bill Street Development Corporation, who sublet it out to Elkington and Kelter, which now you know is Performa, which is now gone, a, a professional, a for-profit management company. And they started, uh, the city made the improvements and started leasing out the buildings 
uh, monthly fee by the square footage and all that with a common area maintenance fee. In 1983, that reopened the, uh, the mission, the three-pointed mission of John Elking, Elking was to restore music back to Bill Street to make it the music capital of the city. That happened. To make it a place where blacks and whites could work together again uh, after the 60s and 70s, the rancorous times there. That happened. And to make it a, a, a place of commerce. Right now, it's the largest revenue grossing tourist attraction in the state of Tennessee is Bill Street. We sell a lot of liquor on Bill Street, okay? Uh, about 25 clubs here. Uh, so that's, the, that's how Bill Street reformed. And that was in the 1980s, for about the first eight or nine years, it was a struggle. Until B.B. King's opened in 1991, you didn't have Silkies, you didn't have Blue City Cafe, you didn't have anything about this half of the street. It was all down near Handy Park. Come on. Can't talk over it, why try? You know? So, anybody heard of B.B. King? <clears throat> His real name is Riley B. King, B E E King. He's born down in India, Tabena, Mississippi, near Indianola, Mississippi, which is near Greenwood, I guess, kind of, sort of, and all the Delta down there. And he was uh, working down there. So, he wanted to come to Memphis. He had one little old guitar he had. He's coming up through Arkansas, got to Twist, Arkansas, one winter. He's playing in a juke joint over there. They had a pot belly stove in the place. Uh, two people got in a fight over the waitress. Uh, somebody kicked over the potbelly stove. The place caught on fire. Everybody ran outside the burning building. But B.B. King remembered his guitar was still in the building. That was his life. That was his ticket to get to Memphis, you know? So he ran back in the burning building to save his guitar. And so what was the name of the waitress? Lucille. That's why he names the guitar Lucille there. And before Gibson guitar closed right there, we were making Lucille guitar right there, the solid body guitar is a Gibson guitar right there. So B.B. King made it to Memphis. Rufus Thomas really helped him out. He became one of the DJs on WDIA with Rufus. Rufus was running the amateur nights down here, and somehow B.B. started winning a few of them, you know? So B.B. really got helped by Rufus and had a great friendship there. And of course, uh, B.B. ended up playing over 15,000 concerts in his life and got the Presidential Medal of Freeman. Uh, Rolling Stone Magazine said, I think he was the third greatest guitar player in the history of the world. And B.B. stands for Bill Street Blues Boy. That's where the BB comes from, he says, on the video at the Memphis Rock and Soul Museum. I got to, one time, you know, BB, when he was alive, by contract, uh, this club opened, <clears throat> he had to play here like four times a year. Back in uh, 1999, he came to play here, and he wanted to park his bus right there where that black car's parked. And uh, uh, the police, uh, not the police department, whatever, uh, the permit office wouldn't let us do that unless I stood out there all night with the bus, bus with the orange cones. Because I didn't want B.B. King. He's played in his club. He's like 75 years old. He's playing 300 concerts a year. And they won't let B.B. King park his bus right there so he can easily just walk in. So I stood out there like 3 o'clock in the morning. But he did two shows, and he, he was really in bad shape. He'd come up. He'd play the first song standing up, and then he said, you don't mind if this old man sits down and plays the blues for you. And he would sit down and then... Go back and he'd sign autographs until the last person left. Go back, do the second show. Do the, that's why I was there at 3 o'clock. Tad, Tad Pearson, uh, Tad even came by. <clears throat> he autographs Tad's Cadillac, you know. So he was that type of guy, old school, rode that bus everywhere except when he flew to Europe. You know, all his concerts would sign every autograph, a very personal person, B.B. King. So we're very fortunate uh, that he did open that club there. And right above it, there's a restaurant called Itabina. That's two words, I-T-T-A-B-E-N-A. -E uh, and it's, a, it's not a fine dining restaurant. It's just not a restaurant like all the other restaurants on Bill Street that has a bunch of beer signs in it and barbecue and this. It's good dining. And I, I, you see the, the gels on the windows that are blue. You go up there, you don't feel like you're on Bill Street at all. It's, and you got to enter from the back or from the center staircase in the middle. There's no signs for it at all. It's like speakeasy style, but it's really good dining up there. I think you'll enjoy going up there. Now we're gonna walk <clears throat> from here. Uh, we're gonna walk down to Silky's cause it's gonna be noisy in there. Now right around the corner, there is a satellite Lansky store that opened about three or four years ago. And on the second floor right here, you enter from the second street side is the Memphis Music Hall of Fame. It opened about three or four years ago, about five years ago now, I guess. It's right on top of the Hard Rock Cafe right here. Okay. Let's go to Silky's, okay?
Let's walk. Y'all good? Get, get closer if you need to. Uh, again, this is Bill Street. It's going to be loud. It's going to happen. It's kind of tough to give tours on Bill Street. Uh, just because that's what it's all about. The noise, the sound, the smells, the people, the flippers. You now, Rodriguez Bonds was our first flipper way back in the 1990s. And golly, I was the mean guy that made the flippers get insurance. These guys are flipping for money, but look what they're flipping on. This is the best surface. This is called Bowmanite, by the way, this surface here. This is actually pressed asphalt. But remember, we used, to, we used to have just brick pavers here with a sand base. When all the beer trucks would come through here, they'd all crack up and everything. So they put a concrete base down. Bricks kept on breaking. So this Bowmanite's held up really good, but it's a very poor surface to be doing flipping on, you know, without mats or all that stuff. So we had to be careful about that. And so they are authorized to flip there. Of course, they were in the movie The Firm. Mitch McDeer flipped with them, you know. Uh, that's just a part of the what anything goes on Beale Street even to this day. Uh, Rum Boogie opened in 1985. Alfred's, believe it or not, was a place called Bernard Chang's. It was a Chinese restaurant in 1983 when it opened. Alfred's came like in 1985. Silky's didn't come till the night, late 1990s. Uh, and the story of this whole structure right here, this is why we came here. This kind of, think about this whole block right here. See, all those buildings in that block, Alfred's, Dyer's, Wet Willie's, every one of those buildings looked like this. They only saved the facade on the Beale Street sides. Everything else was gone, floors and everything. You don't believe me, I'll send you the picture. It looked just like this. And what they did is they put this structure up here so they could save the facade and build back behind it a three-story building. Well, they got all those done, started working on this block, and they found out well, the storm drain system runs underneath here. The Gayoso Bayou, anybody heard of the Gayoso Bayou? It starts down there past the train station, comes right to here, turns right here, goes up through Handy Park, through right field of, of AutoZone Park, up to Danny Thomas, and then down through St. Jude, pass around the pyramid. That's the Gayoso Bayou. And they didn't want to spend like $100,000 at the time below ground with nothing to show for it to stabilize it to put a three-story building in there you see so they put they left this structure up like this back in night that was in the 1980s in 1999 it was going to cost us about seventy-five thousand dollars to move that structure around inside so you wouldn't see it from out here for that building too nobody wanted to spend the money then by that time silky had grown his empire into that patio where he wasn't gonna he was gonna fight it the whole way he wasn't gonna give up a square inch you know silky if y'all knew silky so that's why it stayed like that this whole time. That's the explanation. It's the world's largest pigeon roost too is what we say. So we never walk underneath it. Now another thing about Silky, you have the goat palace over there, right? He's got the two goats. One used to drink Bud Light, one used to drink Budweiser, and then the health department got onto him about that. When I was here in the 90s running the operations of Bill Street, the goat started chewing into the walls of the building next door and created leaks in the basement. So you'll see another fence over there where the goats can't chew into the walls, you know. And about that time, the health department said, we're going to crack down on Silky once and for all. And they told him to take his goats off of Bill Street. You cannot have goats on Bill Street. What did Silky say? Well, there's a hotel on Union Avenue that's got ducks in the lobby. You get that hotel to get rid of those ducks, I'll get rid of my goats. Silky one, health department zero. Those ducks are not leaving the Peabody lobby, and those goats aren't leaving either. Now, the reason why Silky told me he has goats is way back centuries ago over in Ireland when the Vikings were coming across to raid Ireland and England. They'd be coming across the British Channel, I guess it is, or the North Sea. And their, their white sails would flap from a distance. And the goats would be up on the hills and they'd see those white flapping sails and the goats would run down the hill. So the goats were an early warning system to the Irish that the Vikings were coming. So on St. Patrick's Day, they would raise the goats up and lift the goats up and thank them for giving them the early alert of the Vikings raid. So Silky's version of that is he gets a two-man scissor lift here in Memphis. They didn't have two-man scissor lifts in Ireland 50, you know, 500 years ago. He brings the goats out, he puts them on the scissor lift out here and raises them up on the silver, on St. Patrick's Day. Of course, Silky's gone now. 
but he was one of the great entrepreneurs on Bill Street, like Johnny Robinson, like Preston Lamb, like John Elkington, like Bud Chittum, who's gone now, like Tommy Peters. I mean, you can go up and down the street uh, and see a lot of um, merchants who've been here for 20, 30, 40 years who own multiple businesses. Uh, that's the, the backbeat, of the heartbeat, let's say, of Bill Street. Now, we did pass Schwab's. Uh, and it's now owned by descendants of the Saunders family, so the Schwab's actually sold it. I think their motto is, if we don't have it, you don't need it. You know, it's been in business, so that same, that, so floors are the same, they're over 100 years old, they're selling that same junk merchandise, and it's a great place to go, and they got a soda fountain in there now too, so that's pretty cool, a Schwab's. And of course, Jerry Lawler's open on Labor Day 2016. And why I say, of course, I help open it up. My friend Greg Erickson was producing the bands. We had Starship there. You know, we built this city on rock and roll. Mickey Thomas is from Memphis. So we had Starship there on Saturday that weekend. We had a wrestling ring out in Bill Street. Jerry Calhoun was here as the referee. Bill Dundee was here. Jerry Lawler won, by the way. Uh, Jerry Lawler, if everybody know who Jerry Lawler is? Okay, Treadwell High School, he was a great artist, was drawing pictures for Lance Russell about wrestlers. That's how he got into wrestling. Remember Lance Russell? Banana nose Lance Russell, okay. Well, so Jerry, he owns a Batmobile, you know. He's known all over the world being Jerry King Lawler. He does the Comic-Con shows and all that. He's befriended a lot of those people. So on the opening day here, he had two friends. Everybody see the movie A Christmas Story? I remember the guy that got his tongue stuck to the pole? Flick? Flick was here. He has a little miniature Flick with a pole stuck to it, and he's signing autographs 30 years later as Flick. And Scott Fargus was here too. So I went over to get the band at the Westin, and Willie Harrington was in there, okay, at the bar. I said, hey, come on over and, and see Jerry Lala. Oh, the king, I love the king, how, how Dr. Harrington is. And he came over, and Flick goes, oh, you're the guy that beat Lawler for mayor, aren't you? That's Lawler's, that's the world of Lawler. Harrington was a four-time incumbent mayor who, who stomped Lawler, but you're the one that beat Lawler for mayor. So it was a lot of fun. Jerry the King Lawler is the ultimate PR guy. He will sign every autograph. He will take every picture with everybody. And, and he's a real treasure for the city. I hope you've autographed him on library yet. Have you had him? Oh, conversations with Billy. Ever seen some of the conversations with Willie show? on the library channel. He has some of the most fascinating conversations with people like this. So channel 19, by the way, on your Comcast. So anyway, there's a thousand stories up and down Beale Street on the, remember Y2K? Yes. 20, 19 years ago, folks, Y2K, the world was going to end. I was in charge of Beale Street at the time. And uh, so we had to do all these extra precautions in case the whole power grid went out at midnight. You know, what everybody was saying about that. Uh, we had the police, the fire. B.B. Uh, King had come uh, the night before. He played a show at the Peabody Hotel for the Liberty Bowl. That afternoon, he played the halftime show at the Liberty Bowl. That night, he played a 7.30 show in his club. And I had to get him from his club all the way down back behind here to Handy Park. He brought in the Millennium in Memphis. B.B. King did at Handy Park. The next day, he did two shows in Tunica. And on Sunday, he was walking the Washington Mall with President Clinton. That's B.B. King, but B.B. King brought in the millennial here, millennium here. But nothing happened, by the way. You know, that was the biggest ripoff ever, Y2K, right? Until we had that solar eclipse two years ago that clouds went by here. We didn't see anything, did we? All right, let's go across the street to Handy Park. But we get to do historical marker dedications for other people. And one time we had to do one for Saturday Night Jamboree. Anybody heard of that? in the Goodwin building there at 3rd and Madison. Uh, KWEM, that later became KWAM, was broadcasting in the 1950s on Saturday nights. Uh, performers like uh, Joe Manuel and, uh, yeah, and uh, Elvis Presley and Carl Perkins, what's some other names? Uh, they say Elvis did. Yeah, they, Elvis they did say, and yeah. Rockabilly, you know, and, and uh, so Cunning Cunning, can we call you Stunning, stunning cunning? cunning? He was Stunning Cunning at the time about 10 <laughs> years ago. Uh, but he came and performed a lot of rockabilly music. Played on Bill Street, still do, do tours. Every Sunday night. And uh, yeah. at Blue City. Blue City. And uh, are you doing driving tours? And driving tours. Every the day. rockabilly tour? Rockabilly tour. Rockabilly rides, right? Rockabilly rides. Dot com? Dot com. How about that, Willie? <laughs> but if you want to get, you know, there are so many ways from backbeat tours to American Dream Safari to rockabilly rides and, and old convertibles and, 
guys who know that subject of the 40s, 50s, 60s, and blues and beyond. But if you want to get a good, you know, not in the tour bus type of tour, personalized type of tour, Rockabilly Rides is a good one here. He's not going to sing today or anything, but I uh, just want to put a name with a face. Yeah. Hey, take your glasses off. All right. There we go. Now, is that stunning? Hey, come on, yeah. He says he's no longer stunning, <laughs> but he's one of those hardworking people in the streets of Memphis, Tennessee, in the clubs, yeah. in the cars, doing it a variety of ways. And, and the, when you see people around him, they're nodding their head, they're getting into it. So you know he's doing a good job. Yeah. I learned from you. No, you didn't learn from me. But, but everybody does it different, and that's that's just the way it is. Now, Robert's going to start taking up my stuff. You need to talk to Robert here, too. All right. I'll definitely so we'll get with him. So thank you. Thanks. Stunning cunning. We're in Handy Park, WC Handy. You know, here's a great story to tell right here. Is, uh, when you think about Memphis music, nobody was from Memphis. Is that a terrible thing to say? Everybody came to Memphis because Memphis is where everything could happen. Uh, social, business, shopping, banking, government, everything. Transportation, bridges, rails, everything. Crime, vice, drugs, this area, with Gayosa, this whole area was huge. You read Preston Lauderbout's book, Bill Street Dynasty. You read Jim, James Dick Kerr's not Jim Dickens' son, he's a different person. James Dick Kerr's son, Memphis going down. It'll open your eyes wide open to the 20s, 30s, and 40s in this area right here. Oh my goodness, what was going on? But a lot of great music came out, but everybody was coming to Memphis, it's a big melting pot. W.C. Handy and Sam Phillips came from Florence, Alabama. Elvis from Tupelo. B.B. King from Indianola or Itabina. Jerry Lewis from Louisiana. Al Green from Far City. Johnny Cash from Dice, Arkansas. Carl Perkins from Tiptonville. Isaac Cage from Brownsville. Tina Turner from Nutbush. None of them born in Memphis, but they all came here because this is where it could happen. The recording, the scene, the, the contacts. And that's what makes Memphis special right here. This whole 150 mile area all came and collided right here on Beale Street in the 1950s. Became rock and roll at Sun Studio. Became soul at Stax and at Royal. Royal Studios at Ann Peebles, Al Green. Uh, what? Uh, gosh, some other, oh, they were doing uh, Ace Cannon and people like that before that time. Willie Mitchell came on board uh, later on. Then we got Uptown Funk a couple years ago, you know. Uh, number one song in the country. Guess what the last number one song in America was out of Memphis before Uptown Funk? 40 years before that time. Disco Duck. Rick Dees. Rick Dees was a DJ here. We're talking about our great DJs here from B.B. King. From Dewey Phillips over here at WHBQ, played the first Elvis record ever. Wink Martindale, Rufus Thomas, you know, George Klein. And of course, Rick Dees in the 1970s, he was doing, he did a junk song, a novelty song called Disco Duck. In fact, the guy that does the Disco Duck portion was worked at 7-Eleven in West Memphis. Bobby Manuel, if you know Bobby Manuel, he played on that song. So talk to Bobby about all that. And um, uh, so he couldn't play it on his own radio station. It was against the FA, FCC rules. But he did it anyway and got fired, went to the next, I think he went to the WHBQ after that. Became the number one song in the country. Rick Dees went to California, became Rick Dees top 40 for the last 40 years. That came out of Memphis, you see. Off a novelty song, you know. Another great novelty song we had was Wooly Bully by Sam the Sham, number two in the country in 1964. I rode my bicycle to Pop Tunes on summer and bought Wooly Bully for 49 cents. And 40 years later, I'm in the same building. It's a Baskin Robbins. And Sam comes in, Domingo Samudio. He lives in Brunswick. He's still alive this day. I said, I spent 49 cents for your record. Well, if you'd bought 10 more, I'd been number one in the country. Well, buy me an ice cream. So I had to make him buy me a $2 ice cream cone that day. Great guy, Wooly Bully. Uh, Sam the Sham, and another great novelty song was Rufus Thomas, Walking the Dog. It's an old jump rope song, Walking the Dog. Think about that. Rufus was so cool. So you look at how music came in and all melt, and it's melting in here right now. You look at this whole place right now. Well, W.C. Handy left in 1916. Uh, he had come in from uh, Florence, Alabama, and right where Tin Roof is, there's a place there called Pee Wee Saloon. You'll see the historical marker over there. And he went there because it was a place where they had a public telephone. He could book his bands and he could write music in between. Um, and then in, in 1909 to 1912, he got asked to perform music on the street corners for Mr. Crump, who was running for mayor. 
So he wrote a song called Mr. Crump that in 1912 he got permission to call the Memphis Blues. And it was published uh, right here at 4th and Bill at Pace and Handy Music Company. Arguably the first blues song ever published. Now W.C. Handy's great contribution, he took the European instrumentation and merged it with the blues coming out of the Delta, up that blues highway in the here. The field hollers, the work songs, the spirituals became the blues, the country, the gospel that got into Memphis, stirred up in here. This is the crossroads of America's music right here. Highway 61 and Beale Street, now B.B. King Boulevard. Uh, there came rock and roll at Sun and Soul over at uh, Stax and Roy. That's kind of the short version right there of all that. That's how it happened. Uh, we're going to have music here in a minute too, huh? Okay. So, W's Handy went to New York, became very famous, orchestra traveled worldwide. Uh, 1930, Handy Park. This used to be a three-story market house in here. Got torn down, became Handy Park in 1930. He passes in 1958. Statues put in in 1960. Got relocated to here in 2000. Uh, I had to get the design of this park passed before the Memphis Park Commission. They didn't like John Elking because they sent me out there. It's at the garden center that day, and they were changing the senior citizen golf fees. There were about 100 senior citizens in there. They didn't want their golf fees waived, raised $2 a month. But I got to go first, and I wasn't going to let go until we got this passed, okay? We got this design passed. If you remember the first design, the big moat that was in here, no shade or anything on the stage. And, and I designed that over there for the mixing board for the stage they moved, built another one over here but it also doubles as the daytime stage for all the performers that want to perform in here with a cover over it and we got down to the, the building because this is 2000 well, remember nashville they built the stadium for the uh, titans and they had and they just and after they did that they finally said look in most public assembly buildings there's not enough women toilets right because women take twice as long as men basically it's okay uh, so our buddy, state senator from Midtown, Steve Cohen, passed a law saying there has to be twice as many women's toilets as men's toilets for any more public facilities built in Tennessee. It's called the Cohen Potty Parity Law, okay? <laughs> so we had to change from five men's toilets and five women's toilets to five and ten over here. We're the first people to honor the Cohen Potty Parity Law in 20 and 2000 right after Y2K. How about that? Aren't y'all proud of me? Thank you. Uh, they had a contest recently to redesign this, right? They're gonna go for another design. Uh, so we'll just see. Uh, used to be right in here, there was a, a monument to Rufus Thomas. They're doing some type of, some type of construction. Uh, let's go over here to Rufus Thomas Boulevard, okay? We're almost done here. Back on November the 2nd, I got awarded a brass note on Beale Street, okay? And I said, I want to be next to Al James, because Al James has worked here 40 years, okay? He is the strength of Beale Street, who's right next to John Elkington. Turns out that's right here. Now look over here, and there's the Blues Brothers. So I'm going to be right here sometime this summer as a brass note on Beale Street, okay? Now back in 2002, when that was the Hard Rock Cafe, I got to MC the program that dedicated the Blues Brothers brass note with uh, Dan Aykroyd and Jim Belushi. John had already passed, and I got to give him a tour of the Rock and Soul Museum. It was a really neat day, so I'm honored to be right here by Al James, Blues Brothers, and W.C. Hannes looking right down at me. Sometime soon, it'll be in here, and I know it because Al James wants to get his concrete fixed. So this is gonna be the first one to come back in so Al can get his concrete repaired. Okay, that's that story. All right, Handy Park. All right, we're on Rufus Thomas Boulevard. Anybody heard of Rufus Thomas, the world's oldest teenager? He probably doesn't have a permit. If I was here, I'd make him have a $25 permit to do that, you know. Rufus Thomas in 1998, I think it was, got this street. This was former Hernando Street. Went all the way through to Union before they built that garage. Went all the way through to uh, Claiborne Temple and Pontotoc before they built the FedEx Forum. Who was the first person to get a parking ticket on Rufus Thomas Boulevard? Rufus Thomas, right there. Who was the first person to get it annulled? Rufus Thomas. He went down to city council, raised hell. Okay, we'll annul it. And then the police finally figured out which car was his. We wanted Rufus Thomas parking there because he loved walking the street. He loved being Rufus Thomas. I think he passed in 2000 or so, either 2000 or 2001 because 
uh, Marvell, his son, came over to the Rock and Soul Museum and wanted us to sponsor his birthday cake. Now, that was a sheet cake like this, and that was back when we first learned how to start putting images on cake icing, you know? He'd gone like to Cecil's, y'all remember Cecil's, uh, and had Rufus's image on that. Yeah, we'll sponsor that. And we had his birthday party up here at the Black Diamond, and uh, Rufus loved it so much. I said, okay, I'm going to sponsor your birthday cake for the rest of your life. Well, he died before his next birthday, so I wanted to be on that, but... Uh, Great guy, uh, Rufus. Uh, during Watt Stacks, when they all went, they took the whole Stacks Rockster out the Rock Stack, uh, Watt Stacks, L.A. Coliseum. Rufus is out there in his go-go boots, his hot pants. He comes out there and goes, "Hundred thousand black folks here. Nobody been shot yet." <laughs> Only Rufus Thomas could get away with saying stuff like that. You know, just did everything, and loved like coming to Rock and Soul and meeting people and taking pictures and describing how different Stax was than Motown. Motown was soft and symphony. Stax was hard and gritty. Yam Patita, all that beat, you know. Uh, he could say it the best of anybody. So he was a real treasure. April 15th of this year, the day before I left Memphis to move to Knoxville, I was helping Gary Walpole recreate a Don Newman picture of Beale Street with a whole 30-foot tripod thing. So I parked over here on Rufus Thomas Boulevard I got a parking ticket. My last day in Memphis, I got a parking ticket on Rufus Thomas Boulevard. I took a picture, I'm gonna frame it, because it was an honor to get a parking ticket. I pay 21 bucks, I pay it. But I, that's kind of cool, I think. Now, right over here, Ida B. Wells, you see the statue right over, uh, a historical marker. Uh, she's in six murals around town, uh, but she was a school teacher. She came from Holly Springs, Mississippi, teaching school here, started writing for the Free Speech and Telegraph in the Bill Street Baptist Church down there. Uh, Started writing about uh, inferior schools and, uh, and inferior opportunities for blacks in Memphis. And then in 1892, there was a lynching at People's Grocery. And uh, she wrote about that. She got her offices burned. She got run out of town uh, because of her bravery there. Went to New York City. Uh, later on, became one of the originating founders of the National NAACP, National Association for Colored People. I won't say NCAA, you know, I always get mixed up. So Ida B. Wells, a school teacher out of Memphis, lived in the neighborhood over here, worked over here. There's a historical mark for her. Sometime in the next five years, we hope we have a statue up here where she used to live near the Church of God of Christ up there. Stay tuned on that. Here's Pee Wee's saloon right here. Uh, that's the saloon where W.C. Handy wrote his songs in and made his phone calls. And then right when we walk up the street, we got a historical marker for Rufus Thomas and for Nat D. Williams. Uh, who was the first black DJ on WDIA in 1948, Nat Williams, a school teacher, by the way. You got Gillis Brothers and uh, George Jackson, a pharmacist. These are all Tennessee Historical Commission markers, the silver ones with the stars on them. Come this fall, we're going to put a historical marker up here for the Chop Suey Cafe. Anybody heard of the Chop Suey Cafe? Anybody heard of the Long Kong Ten Year Association? I didn't until this year, so I'm going to sound real smart here. The Chinese Historical Society of Memphis in the Mid-South came to us uh, with a, a historical marker right down here where Gibson used to be, where FedEx World Logistics is going in, 233 South BB King Boulevard. There's a historical marker there now. On one side, it's the Lung Kong Ten Year Association. On the other side, it is the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. So basically, my short story of that is, Chinese build the railroads in the country, the Irish and the Italian come in, kick them out to China, say you can't come back in unless you're born here, you can't bring any family members in. So that's the Chinese Exclusion Act that Congress passed. They got reduced, let's say, by the Magnuson Act in 1943, but Chinese couldn't go, had to make a decision. So in places like Memphis, they had associations, like they had the Jewish neighborhood house up in the pinch for the Jewish population who didn't know the language, didn't know how to count money, didn't know the customs burials, funerals, and Chinese got dispersed all out through the Delta. If you go into the Delta, Chinese could go into the black neighborhoods where whites couldn't go. Chinese could go into white neighborhoods where blacks couldn't go. So they could walk on both sides of the street, open restaurants, grocery stores, laundries. I used to drive a bus around picking up kids in the 70s. For our, We had a bilingual service on Sunday afternoons at First Baptist Church. I was a recreation director going through college, and my wife was the minister of music for the Chinese service. and. Uh, we had a Chinese fellowship night and they wanted to have a softball team. I could fill the whole team of chins, chows, and chews. Chew was spelled three different ways, by the way. We had a great, in fact, two of those guys last, uh, on May 25th, 
were here and they wrote the text, Richard Jew and Davis Jew. Yeah, we had Baptist Chinese Jews at First Baptist Church. They, wrote, they read the text. They were on my softball team in the 1970s. So we dedicated that marker and Chop Suey Cafe is going up here along with the Chinese merchants of Bill Street because it was the longest running business on Bill Street and Chop Suey is an American dish. Okay, another couple of musical markers we have in the work. We just passed on Thursday the text for the Antenna Club, 1588 Madison. That'll be dedicated October 5th. You want to be there. And then probably August 17th, we're going to dedicate a historical marker for WHER down at 972 South 3rd Street, the site of the third Holiday Inn ever. That's where WHER opened up, the first all female radio station in the country. So not only do we break the color bearing radio, for our country in Memphis, Tennessee with WDIA, we broke the gender barrier in 1955 with WHER, 1,000 beautiful watts is what it was called. Okay, so that's some historical markers coming up. We have fun with the markers. Let's go up here to Withers. We're gonna stop in at Withers for a second, okay? Get outside this noise. For Ernest Withers, 1948 to about 2007, took about 1.8 million images, are we up to that? And still counting, apparently, they're going with the white gloves of, of the African-American life, not only in Memphis, but in the South, the Mid-South, the Civil Rights Movement, Negro League Baseball, you name it, behind the scenes in, in theaters and concerts and uh, in the hotel rooms with Dr. King, on the bus in Montgomery, on the boycott. He was actually on that bus for like five hours. They wouldn't arrest him. <laughs> they're, they're waiting for Dr. King is what he told me. When I became the director of the Memphis Rock and Soul Museum, we opened it in 2000. About half of those images in the Memphis Rock and Soul Museum by the Smithsonian are Ernest Withers images. And he would come in there every day wanting to talk and tell stories. And, and one day in February of 2002, it snowed the night before. So I lived like two blocks away. So I told everybody to stay home. I'd go open the museum for about two hours in case anybody from Europe was in town and didn't know that in snow in the South, we stopped doing everything because they walk in snow in Europe, I guess, you know. And uh, sure enough, I went there and about 15 people came in in the first two hours and it cleared out. I'm closing the place up. I'm going home. My telephone rings. Jimmy Ogle, this is Ernest Withers with the Bill Street FBI. That's how he always called me all the time. He'd always say that. And later on, there's a story about that, you know. And uh, I want to come down there. I got Tony Deaconess in town and Daniel Wolf. He was writing the book Memphis Blues again. He has pictures tell the story, Negro League Baseball. He's got three Memphis Blues again. He's got the Emmett Till booklet. He's got three books, right? Negro League Baseball, about, right? And in fact, the pictures tell the story. It was an exhibit that traveled like in Boston, Denver, Tampa, traveled the country. Uh, and a lot of great images. You see some of these images on the wall here. They're still going through boxes of slides with the white gloves. Now his studio was back in the back of this building. This was a hallway on the other side of this wall. This was Wilbert in the 1990s when I was working on Bill Street. This was Wilbert Taylor's t-shirt shop. And RJ had a tattoo parlor right there. Then you got the Withers dark room and the Withers offices. Now they've taken over this whole thing with the Withers collection. Uh, right next door, you got James Clark, Eel, etc., where the the deal on Beale is for real or something like that. But James Clark has been here since 1983. That is the oldest continuously run business on New Beale Street is James Clark right there on the other side of the hallway. So Withers, after he passed away in 2007, he had seven sons, one daughter. Roz came back and kind of took charge of this part of the, the life, the collection, the archival with Rhodes College, um, you know, keeping things alive with the Withers Collection. This is a fabulous museum to come back here. Mainly open in the afternoons and night to kind of follow the Bill Street crowd. Now back in that 2002, when he called me up, he had those people in town, they were at Alfred's eating lunch. They want to come through the museum. I just turned off all the AVs, all the lights and everything. So I go, I say, okay, Mr. Withers. And I went down to Alfred's. I walked down there in the ice and snow and said, well, I'm going to drive down there. Now, one thing you never did with, with, with Mr. Withers, you never got in a car with him. He was the worst driver ever. He didn't have any rear view mirrors on his car. He was knocking them off all the time, you know. And you didn't want to ride with him. So I'll walk back and open up the museum when we're ready to go. And I noticed him kind of limping around. I'll get you a wheelchair, Mr. Withers. It'll be okay. We'll, we'll go around. Because Daniel Wolf, he was going to go through and identify every picture in the museum. That's B.B. King and Muddy Waters at the Sunflower Blues Festival in 1961. And, he could, and Daniel was taking notes and they were taking pictures for Memphis Blues Again. You got a copy of that book here you can show them, can't you? Great book. Memphis, there it is right there. Memphis Blues Again. I think, and here's Negro League Baseball, but his, I think his books are out of print. We need to get him back into print. So this is a book that got created that day. And about halfway through, we spent about four hours doing this. About halfway through, Mr. Withers had to go to the restroom. So I wheeled him down to the restroom 
And by that time, his leg had really kicked in his knee, and he couldn't get out of the chair. So you want to be Mr. Withers here? Come on. Come on, Mr. Withers. Let me get you out of that chair, Mr. Withers. So I pick Mr. Withers up, bring him over to the stand-up toilet. All right, Mr. Withers, both my hands are up in the air. You've got to do the rest. Jimmy Ogle, you're my eighth son. <laughs> he loved me for doing that, helping him pee that day in the stand. And I got him back into the chair. Good job, good job. Okay, get out. All right, good sport. But that, that's, and he, I mean, I has had such a special relationship for the next five years. He would bring me pictures of like, he brought me one. He knew I liked baseball. And Jackie Robinson had played major league, uh, minor league baseball in Memphis when we had the Memphis Red Sox over here playing at uh, Martin Stadium. R.S. Lewis and Son's Funeral over here, and the four doctors, the Martin Medical Brothers, own the team and own the stadium. That's the only one of its kind in the Negro League Baseball Association. T.J. or T.H.A.'s Funeral Home owned the Birmingham Black Bearings. They owned Willie Mays during that time. Um, and he would travel through here before they signed with the Major Leagues. Apparently, Jackie Robinson signed his Major League Baseball contract in Memphis, Tennessee, in the Martin Medical Building, which is at the corner of Vance and Lauderdale. That's a little known fact right there. The guy that broke the color barrier in Major League Baseball. So Withers is always on the scene for all these things, baseball, whatever. His books are just fantastic to read, and there's several other books written about him. Yeah, he covered Dr. King. He was on the balcony that day. King got shot. He did not take that picture of everybody pointing. It's my understanding there's a young man from New York that did that. Uh, and since he, and Mr. Withers was also one of the first eight black policemen in Memphis in 1948 in the white police department. His beat was Beale Street. Uh, he couldn't arrest, he couldn't put handcuffs on a white person. He could only detain him and call a white cop to come down and arrest him at that time. That's how that started out. And then, uh, so the police knew him. So that guy was going to go to develop that film. And when they got over here to this dark room right in here to develop that iconic shot, Withers was going, that guy's all shook up. He ain't going to, he's going to ruin, he's going to expose the film. So he knocked on the door and he actually developed that picture that he did not take. One of the most famous pictures of all time he did not take, but he developed it here. The pointing one, you know, he was on yeah. that balcony, you know, with Dr. King, April 4th. So he was everywhere. Uh, yeah, uh, a man raising eight children, nine children, really. Uh, during that time, was take, he was selling pictures everywhere. Uh, I don't think he was an intentional informant for the FBI or the CIA or whatever you want to call it during that time. Yeah, the information was exchanged. He said in his book, Pictures Tell a Story, he admits on the front end, I, you know, I gave him information, but I tried to stay out of all the meetings. I kept it on the outside, not on the inside. And of course, there's been several other books written about, here's a big informant and all this stuff. But take it as you like it. I knew the man personally, known some of his families. He outlived about three or four of his children, didn't he? Billy and Teddy and, and all that. But uh, just an incredible guy to be around. I got to do book signings with him. You know, I would do the driving, by the way. <laughs> uh, he's just a real treasure. Now, this place right here, Withers Collection, this ought to be your staycation pledge right here, to come back to this place and walk through here. There's some other pictures in some other rooms. There's actually a room back here. You can have a meeting here. You know, if you don't have a place for a meeting and catering and all that, uh, there's programming done here. We do Talk It Out Tuesdays in February, panel discussions, you know. I got to be on a panel here with Judge Joe Brown last year. Boy, you talk about a guy who knows a lot of stuff and we'll talk about it and be demonstrative. Oh yeah. He actually, he actually got to review the reopening of the James Earl Ray case. He got to see all that evidence firsthand. He's not making that stuff up. Judge Joe Brown. So uh, thank you guys for letting us come in here and do this. I appreciate that. You tell Roz I came by and uh, other ladies, Miss Williamson. Angela. Angela. Yeah, Miss Williamson. And I came by. Yeah, well, I, I was coming through about three or four months ago and they called me over and we came in. Where's the Rosa Parks? There's Rosa Parks. They, they let me help open the crate for Rosa Parks right there. There was a sculptor that came in a couple years ago that wanted to do that sculpture. And he did it and sent it down. So there's Rosa Parks right there. Because Dr. King, I mean, Dr. King, Dr. Witters had taken a picture, a lot of pictures of Rosa Parks. And I got to uncrate that thing right there. Uh, that was special to me. They thought of me that way. So uh, thank you guys. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. The name Robert Church is uh, synonymous with Memphis from the middle of the 19th century up to the middle of the 20th century. The whole Robert Church family. Robert Church Sr. was a young man. Oh, he, Shipwrecked, let's say, out in the Mississippi River, came to Memphis, started buying up property during the Civil War, and afterwards, and during the yellow fever epidemic, he stuck it out, buying up property when many people were leaving. Uh, became the South's first black millionaire, they say. He bought the first note to get Memphis out of bankruptcy. 
in the 1890s or 1880s after the yellow fever epidemic put us in a bankruptcy. Uh, he passed away in 1912 and then his son carried on the tradition, Robert Church Jr. And then the whole family, when you look at the other historical markers here, Sarah, Roberta Church, uh, Mary Church Terrell, uh, the famous uh, Terrell Hospital, the black hospital over in the medical center was named uh, by that family. Uh, were the leaders of the black community at a time when, when again, a segregated century, post-Civil War, post-Reconstruction, uh, in migration from the Delta in the 1880s, 1890s, immigration from Europe into Memphis. Memphis was a melting pot. So we go from 10,000 people in 1880 in bankruptcy to 100,000 people here 20 years later in 1900. And between 1900 and 1910, less than 10% of the people living in Memphis were actually born in Memphis. That's what a big melting pot this whole area was. Italian, Jew, Jewish, German, uh, Irish, whites, only in the north part of town, center part of the court, with the black population centered in the Beale Street area and on out this way uh, to the southwest. A uh, high concentration of black families, black businesses. Uh, most of the businesses on Beale Street during that time were owned by whites, but blacks could patronize those businesses. Blacks could not go up on Main Street. Uh, whites could come down to Bill Street sporadically. Uh, there'd be the Thursday night rambles anybody could attend. There are certain times whites were kind of welcome down to spend the money. But the state light night, night, no. And now, we also had Gay Oso on one side and Lieutenant Lee Street over here later on, but you had Vance where other nightclubs and other dens of iniquities, you might say, uh, houses of commercial affection, as we say at Elmwood Cemetery, uh, we were the cocaine capital of the world, the murder capital of the world. It was a hard town, even during the Crump administration that was always bragging about cleaning things up. It was separate but equal, and many things were controlled politically uh, by the races and by the leaders of the races. Uh, that probably has a more lasting effect on anything on the city, I think, than slavery ever did or other situational things in the 19th century. That's 20th century stuff there, folks. Uh, but Robert Church here built, you see an outline, the columns here, of an auditorium built in the early 1900s was the largest public assembly building for blacks in the entire world, they say, in the early part of the century, the Robert, the Church Auditorium here. Uh, you'll see in some pictures, it was called the Beale Avenue Auditorium, because at one time the white politicians changed the name from Beale Street to Beale Avenue, because all the east-west streets ran as avenues and all the north-south were streets. Uh, in the 1950s, Danny Thomas came to town and didn't like that. He wrote a song called Bring Back Beale Street. And they changed the name back to Bill Street City Council after Danny Homage put a lot of pressure on him. So Bill Street's the name. Uh, and like we say at the turn of the century is a, a mile of vice of commercial, a mile of commercial ambition. I'm sorry, a mile of vice and commercial ambition owned by the Jews, policed by the whites, and enjoyed by the Negroes. And it went from basically Bill went all the way down to the river to the cobblestones, there was a landing and the boats would come up there and the steamboats would and all the captains hated coming to Memphis because the deckhands hadn't seen a bottle of liquor in a week or a woman in a week or a party in a week on the river or two and get off and they might not ever see their deckhands again. They might run away, they might get kidnapped, they might get killed, they might get married, who knows what might happen to them when they came to Bill Street. So, uh, but anything went, Rufus Thomas once said about if a white person was if you were black on Bill Street on a Saturday night, you'd never be want, want to be white again. That's one of Rufus's great quotes, you know. But it went from the river uh, up, to, up to the top of the hill to Main Street, Front Street, second, third, now B.B. King, fourth, on down past uh, Danny Thomas here, which was Wellington, or La and then Lauderdale, and then on past the Hunt Feeling Home at uh, Orleans. So it's about an eight block long stretch here two and three story buildings that in the 1950s and 60s, we had 15 different urban renewal projects came through here. Uh, over 3,000 buildings were torn down in about 1,500 acres. We called it urban removal. And to this day, you can see a lot of vacant lots still around here. Uh, thinking that Bill Street would be rebuilt faster. It didn't really happen until the 1980s. Now in the 1980s, this area here for Church Park, Church Park was basically the auditorium. And since a lot of this land was vacant, vacated because of urban renewal, uh, Church Park acreage was increased to about 14 acres, I believe, right in here. Wraps around to 4th Street, over to Dr. Martin Luther King Boulevard there. Quite a few great festivals are here now. The African and April, April festivals here annually. The, the Pride Festival is here. Uh, you'll see a lot of activities going on here during the course of the year in this good green spot in downtown Memphis. We don't have enough of these in the core of downtown. Most of them are smaller pocket parks. Uh, you see several historical markers down here. I mentioned one for the church family, Sarah Roberta Church, Mary Church Terrell. 
church family members, both men and women were very influential uh, in civil rights, in business, in social life in the community. And then the green marker all the way down is for Abram Langston Taylor and uh, Phi Beta Sigma fraternity. We dedicated that in 2011. Uh, there was a store there called Bumpus Grocery, B-U-M-P-A-S, about where the, on the other side of where the fence is. And uh, Abram Langston Taylor got the inspiration for, why not, have, why not have a national black fraternity? And the inspiration came behind, behind the uh, stove they were standing by talking, everybody's shooting bull at the end of the day. And that was actually formed in Philadelphia several years, years later. Uh, but the inspiration came from right here. So Phi Beta Sigma on their 100th or centennial anniversary dedicated this plaque here. Uh, Harold Collins was a city councilman at the time. That he was a member of Phi Beta Sigma. And a bunch of the members were here. They marched from Peabody over here. I helped with the dedication. So I was with the Shelby County Historical Commission at the time. And I looked at a man next to me. He, I said, you look like John Lewis. He was, I am John Lewis. <laughs> well, dumb me, but John Lewis, who's still like a 50-year congressman from Georgia, was one of those members who was here that day. So you never know who you're going to run into and, and meet in a funny way, meet in a cordial way, whatever. We had a great relationship that day. Uh, just a great event right here, uh, Phi Beta Sigma. Uh, let's walk down this way just a little bit, Willie. Back in the middle 1980s, the Memphis Park Commission had this property and developed this with the housing community development, uh, developed this property and, and did the outline of the old auditorium or close to the outline. They said it was about 2,000 seats uh, here. Uh, and from the old pictures, you look inside, it was a, a horseshoe ring, a balcony around the top loaded with people. Uh, once upon a time, Teddy Roosevelt spoke here as the president, I believe. Uh, a lot of great events here. Of course, W.C. Handy was up and down this area of the street. If we can kind of swing around, kind of reverse me right here and look over to, to these two buildings. Now, imagine this building here on my right, a similar building like that right here, 392 Bill. That's 386 Bill. Where a similar building like that was right here at 392 Bill where Solvent Savings Bank was, one of Robert Church's banks, and that's on the second floors where Pace and Handy Music Company was located. Uh, that's where he first published the Memphis Blues in 1912. Unfortunately, that building is no longer here. Uh, but similar to that building right next door, that church also owned as well. Okay, uh, This building was built in the 1960s right here. It's just a storage building right now. Uh, there is a historical marker. We moved from this side of the street over here because this area behind us here is going to become a part of the Union Road development. So we want to go ahead and get the marker relocated over to Church Park that talks about Solvent Savings Bank to get out of the footprint of construction, getting hit by construction, you know, or whatever. So uh, that's the marker right there. Let's walk down to Bill Street Baptist Church now, okay? We're standing on the property right now. Back in 1982, Muhammad Ali opened up the Town 2 Theater right here. <laughs> Here's it gone. So behind us is what we often call Beale Street Baptist Church, but it's actually First Baptist Church, Beale Street. It's the mother church of all black congregations in the city, they say. Um, uh, slaves worshiped here, built by slave labor, let's say. Uh, and you look at the unusual stained glass window shape up there, the, the circular. When you go inside that building, you came, that's what the value of doing the church tours are. You go inside and the sunlight fills through and you see the beauty of the stained glass, which you can't do here. This church is in not good repair right now. It still has an active congregation. It does. Uh, Morris Henderson was like the first uh, preacher. He was a great leader in the middle of the 19th century. You'll see that name on a, on a street up in North Memphis, but Morris Henderson's a name. And it's been here, First Baptist Church, Beale Street. Uh, when you go down to Lauderdale near Booker T. Washington High School, another church, First Baptist Church, Lauderdale, broke off from this church. And a lot of our churches in the downtown area have sister churches and congregations that split on out, uh, whether it's First Baptist Church in Bellevue and Second Baptist. And you start looking how there's a, a taproot of all these congregations. This is the taproot of the African-American Baptist population here. Um, you see a historical marker over there for that church put up by the Shelby County Historical Commission. Edward Cooley at Jones and William Baldwin with the architects, same people that were the architects for the James Lee House. Okay. Claiborne Temple, 18, it's on here somewhere, 1891, I think. Yeah, 18, organized 1844. This is the third version of Second Presbyterian Church, by the way. 1891, right there, May 14th. Uh, historical marker over there. Let's come over here. First version was over there where AutoZone is now on Front Street because 
First Presbyterian Church was too far to walk to up on Poplar Avenue. So they put a second Presbyterian Church there. Up at 7th in Chelsea, they put a third Presbyterian Church. The white brick church you see up there, that was third Presbyterian Church because it's too far to walk from Chelsea to First Presbyterian Church. And so this one moved over to where the parking garage is for Hampton Garages now at Main and Beale, that area. Or not, we're Tri State Bank, kind of that area, I mean. And uh, that was there during the Civil War, and that's where the Union occupied the church. And the minister, Southern minister, asked, sent a letter to Lincoln to get him out of the sanctuary with their horses. And, you know, the soldiers would be in the balcony and the horses would be down low. They did in a lot of churches. And Lincoln sent a letter and got him kicked out. And he invited the minister to come to Washington, D.C. That was in the 1860s. Well, in the 1960s, Jeb Russell went up from Second Presbyterian Church and visited with Richard Nixon. He fulfilled that 100 years later. Uh, and since this was Second Presbyterian Church in the 1950s or about 1951 or two, it moved out to Second, I mean to Poplar and Goodlett. That's where Second Presbyterian Church is. Filled in by an AME congregation up to about 2000, 2001. It kind of just piddled out. It went away. Been vacant to about three years ago. Uh, hopefully it'll be closed down now for about a year or so to get the proper restoration done. They've had a lot of events going on the last two or three years with worthy events. Making this really, uh, uh, you know, Rotary Club, symphony, movies, speeches. I mean, you name all church on Sunday. Yeah. And all they're getting the preservation grants in to where they, this can be properly restored. Because there are holes in the ceiling, holes in the wall. You had to come out here for a while to the restrooms outside. No business can stay open that way. But to get through the MLK 50 and all that, to get to I'm a Man Plaza built. Uh, this is where the sanitation strikes all kicked off from. Went down Hernando to Beal, Beal to Main, Main to City Hall. The last two public events of Dr. King's life were in Memphis, Tennessee, and he won from Memphis, Tennessee. The last march of his life stepped off March 28th right here. That's the one that had the posters like this. I'm a man to Ernest Withers picture, okay? You'll see pictures before that time in the marches. There are handheld signs or strings around them. And Mr. Withers told me this story He's, the night before. He said, Jimmy, the white rednecks didn't want us, in, want us in town, Dr. King in town, stirring things up, and the black radicals didn't think he was moving fast enough, the invaders and the panthers. So they went and bought the sticks and nailed the posters to the sticks so when the trouble broke out the next day, they could pull the sticks off and have something to defend themselves with. And that's the story behind that picture, the man who took the picture, who man who put the signs on the stake. I believe it, okay? And sure enough, that happened, and the fight, the stuff broke out, windows got broken. King gets swept away to the Rivermont, gets criticized for that. So when he comes back April 3rd, he goes to the black-owned hotel, rather than being the white-owned hotel, Lorraine Motel, where it has the outdoor balconies and exposed himself security-wise. Also, he was being faithful to that, being faithful to the law. He was non-violent, non peaceful protest. He was not going to, it's 2.30, there goes the boat. Hear it? I orchestrated that, I got a little pulse. One, two, three. Yeah, one long whistle, three short whistles. That's the boat leaving the harbor. So, that's the Island Queen 230 sightseeing cruise. Dr. Creek didn't ride on that, by the way. So, he was nonviolent, peaceful protest. He wasn't going to march again until they went to court. The city had placed an injunction against the march happening because of all the trouble. April 4th, uh, Lucis Birch, Mike Cody, Andrew Young go to federal court, get the court li order lifted. Mike Cody's driving. Andrew Young down to the Lorraine Motel drops him off. By the time Mike Coney gets home in Midtown, he hears on the radio, King's been shot. So they would have marched the next day, April 5th. Might have, he might have been killed somewhere else, but not that day at that moment, 6.01 p.m. It happened. So the night before, April 3rd, Dr. King had given the last speech of his life at Mason Temple. When you're on the roof of the Peabody, you can see that red roof out there in the trees, the Mason Temple right on the other side of Crump, uh, where the last speech of his life was given. Shot on the Lorraine Motel, pronounced there. Went to St. Joseph Hospital. Then right around over here, you got Irish Lewis and Son's Funeral Home. We put a historical mark over there about five years ago uh, where his body was prepared for viewing in Memphis for a day before it went to Atlanta. Ms. King comes back and finishes the march. Uh, two weeks later, the strike gets settled. Uh, these are the names of the 1,100 black sanitation workers. I'm not going to go through that whole story on the wall right there. If you walk around the pathway here, the circular pathway, like beginning in... January of 1968, there's a timeline of the events of the whole leading up to all that. Right as you walk through there, it's a very good timeline. You see some of the quotes right here. Uh, this is a great little plaza right here, I think, and a very appropriate plaza. This is where the marches originated from, stepped off from, let's say. 
Uh, this was called the, the African American Episcopal Church, the minimum wage building. I don't know reason why, but Heritage Tours of Memphis is in there. Elaine Turner, who runs Slave Haven Burkle Estate, uh, she's on the Tennessee Historical Commission. She does. The, she has the best information on African American tours in this area. And then in this last two years, uh, Housing and Community Development had developed a, a map and an app, app, uh, for a heritage tour of all this area between Main Street, Beale Street, East Street, and Crump, the 38126 basically, of all the things that have gone on in that century of black history in Memphis. We don't talk about much. We usually talk stop at slavery and start at sanitation strike. But you think about the insurance people, uh, the preachers, the teachers, we do real good with black basketball players and black musicians, but all the other folks that contributed to the black history of Memphis, we're finally starting to pick up on. We're adding by adding, not adding by subtracting, and doing the same thing with women's history too with the trail we started as well. And there's an app for that. So um, I'm glad we're starting to pick up on other history of Memphis. And this is a very important area all through here. Folks, you're at the intersection of King and King. What other city has an intersection of King and King? B.B. King Boulevard, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue, King and King. I bet you there's no other city with the intersection of King and King. We've had three kings of Memphis. Elvis the King gave us our voice. B.B. King gave us our soul. Dr. Martin Luther King gave us our conscience, okay? That's a quote from A.C. Wharton. We'll give him appropriate credits here. A.C. Wharton made that one up. I like that one there. We didn't mention Jerry the King Lawler, did we? Or King Cotton, <laughs> you know? But uh, this is a great intersection. This should be Linden Avenue. Used to be... <clears throat> used to be 3rd Street. Now, technically, Highway 61 never physically made it to Beale Street. If you look at the maps, Highway 51 turns at Crump Boulevard and goes to Arkansas and goes up that way. But just like the Underground Railroad, somehow those people kept on coming and made it to here. If you look at the old, see how this street, it goes back and forth, back and forth. If you drive it, it ain't a straight street. And they had to hook some streets together in here like Rayburn and 3rd, like over here with McLemore and Lauderdale and all that. So, uh, but the spiritual Highway 61, the Blues Highway made it to Bill Street. Obviously it did uh, where the physical one. So you have a Tennessee Highway 61, some promotional signs out because there was an effort to kind of link all the sites music related between the Mississippi State Line and downtown. There's a brochure about that. This was a, uh, the number three fire station about 120 years ago. Fire station number three. Back in the 1980s, 86 and 87, they brought Chips Moman back to town. Chips had been at Sun Studio, had been at Stax from 1962 to 1972. Chips was over at American Studios at Chelsea and Thomas. Okay, it's a family dollar store there now. We did a historical marker over there a couple years ago. Chips was still alive, the Memphis Boys, the 827 band, I think it's called, 827 Thomas Street. Uh, but during that time, e, they had over 100 top 100 songs. Songs like Son of a Preacher Man, Sweet Caroline, you ever sung, ever heard that song? Written by Neil Diamond in the Peabody Hotel, recorded at American Studios. He also did Holly Holy and Brother Love's Traveling Show there. Uh, B.J. Thomas, uh, Joe Tex, I Gotcha, Dionne Warwick, uh, Sandy Posey, uh, what is, oh, the Box Tops. Alex Chilton in 1967 was a 10th grader when he sang, Give Me a Ticket for an Aeroplane. That's a 10th grader's voice. Uh, the Gentries, Keep On Dancing. Just great songs like that. I mean, it was the hottest studio. You also had Stax Gin at the time. Sun had kind of gone by its own wayside. Uh, gee, on Sweet Caroline, y'all go, Sweet Caroline, and what do you do? Do you do that, 5K? Say no. 5K doesn't do that. Don't do that. Okay? Why, Jimmy? That's Andrew Love and Wayne Jackson. The Memphis Horns are on that record. They're on over 100 Grammy Award-winning records, like 15 gold. Two Memphis Horns did the ba-ba-ba. So in respect, don't do the ba-ba-ba. That's all I'm saying. Okay, just in respect. Uh, they're both passed away now. Uh, Wayne's buried at Emwood Cemetery. Peas and Carrots, it's on that tour. The, the Willie Brothers, does, uh, the Doobie, Brothers Doobie Brothers, all got Led Zeppelin. He started. They, they bought his headstone. Oh, wow. Uh, so they were all, if you look at the Memphis Horns, all the places they've charted and been on with folks, it's amazing the bands from all over that use them for a horn section. At, at Royal, at Stax, and around, at Ardent, and all around. Um, so don't do that, okay? Okay. Uh, here, 1986, uh, Chips recorded Carl Perkins. He recorded Ringo Starr. I got my picture made with a beetle. 
the ugly beetle, Ringo, on a riverboat out there in the river. Got a great picture there when he played on the riverboat. And uh, I was monitoring build this, this building in 99 and 2000 for Bill Street. We were storing Clink Brothers ice cream boxes in here. And uh, uh, so I come in with a flashlight and look for leaks or rats or dead bodies or whatever, you know. And I tripped over this pole one time. So I pulled this pole out. And on the end of it was a sign, a white sign with blue lettering on it. Don't dare, uh, this place reserved for, with a big star, Carl Perkins. Don't dare park here. That's my sign. <laughs> that sign is in Carl Perkins' exhibit at the Memphis Music Hall of Fame. That place was reserved for Carl Perkins, right? So I donated to the Memphis Music Hall of Fame. Along with, you see the sandwich board in there from WHBQ from the 1950s when I was helping with the Chiska, uh, I went up in the attic and found that and snuck it out one night. <laughs> I told Terry Lynch, look, I'm gonna go in the building tonight and steal something, don't tell nobody. And I gave him, I had this plaque I had that somebody bought for $15 at the Todd Estate Sale at Anstale. In 1975, J.O. Patterson of Church of God in Christ gave the Todd family a plaque about this big. It's like you won the spelling bee plaque, okay? In appreciation to the Todd family for the gift of Hotel Chiska to the Church of God in Christ, basically is what it says. If you see a mock picture of me on Time Magazine, I'm holding that plaque, okay? And a picture, a mock picture. And uh, so it was for sale for $15. They bought the hotel for $10. That plaque was much more than a hotel. So I gave that to Terry uh, with uh, the people that were gonna buy the building. I said, use this as collateral. You're gonna appreciate what I get out of here. I just don't want nobody to throw it away prematurely. Cause that, when we restored one of our downtown parks recently, one of the old historical markers got thrown away cause the construction company didn't know any better. So that sandwich board from the 1950s, I took it home and cleaned it up. It is exhibited in there too. So uh, I found, uh, Captain Jake found an I'm a man poster in 1968 on the street. 1995, I'm cleaning out the showboat. It's falling behind furniture. He gave it to me. One auction the next year for $4,000. I loaned mine to the Memphis Rock and Soul Museum. The next year, one, one there's only six of them left in the world. One got uh, bought at Sotheby's Antiques for $42,000. I said, up that insurance on that thing, you know. And now it's out at the Pink Palace Museum. So you never know in somebody's attic in some old building what you're gonna find. When you go to your grandma's house, get up in that attic and look for no old pictures and stuff. We don't have, Bartlett doesn't have a picture of Gabriel Bartlett, who Bartlett is named for from the 1860s, stuff like that. It's gonna be, we don't have a picture of the tropical freeze, a good picture of the tropical freeze. Anybody remember that at Popper and White Station? Not even a back shot of like White Station or over in the high school students going there. So there's, you're gonna find things that we don't have pictures of and that's the beauty of networking and talking all this stuff out, you know, so keep your eyes open. All right, King and King, take the picture right there. This is now Memphis Music Initiative, uh, empowering you through music, okay? So this has been returned to be an office building and a good building. And then right over here, if you look right here, you can see my historical marker right down there by the steps for the Lung Kong 10 Year Association, say that real fast after me, and the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Now I'm gonna, this week I'm gonna take it down because they're getting ready to do construction up in that part of the building. I don't wanna be hit by construction. So I'm gonna put another little fake sign on it that tells what's happening. It's gonna be in my backyard. And we're gonna bring it back when we get through with the construction. I'm tired of things getting hit by mowers and construction. This sculpture right here, Jocelyn Welshberg, uh, back in 1977, along with the Mallory Knights, got this done. It used to be up on the mall by the convention center. Remember, I've been to the mountaintop. Skateboarders loved it. <laughs> then when they built the uh, trolley part, it got moved over kind of to the side and displaced. And great opportunity here by Memphis Light, Gas, and Water. Right here was a former federal credit union here or something in a little parking lot. And then probably MLG and W credit union, a little building right here, about a 20 car parking lot. Finally got rid of that. And what a great spot to have on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue. Brought this sculpture back down. And then you have the pools of water over here. You have Ernest Withers photographs over here. You have some copy about this park, Dr. King and Memphis Civil Rights Movement on both sides as you come in, just a night. Nice, quiet. Right below us is a parking garage, <laughs> you know. And we don't know how far that parking garage went north, so that's why we didn't dig the hole either. We didn't want to go into a parking garage either without spraying. But um, what a great way to, to end today at Dr. Martin Luther King Reflection Park. It came online in 2018 during the MLK festivities along with I'm a Man Plaza. Uh, if you look, look at the FedEx World Logistics going right here, but also when you look at that corner down there, the parking lot right there, 
There's that whole parking lot. Well, you can see right there, now leasing. See the buildings that are going to be built in that parking lot right there? 12 story buildings right there, three of them on that whole parking lot, right on the Gayosa Bayou. That's where the Gayosa Bayou goes underground for the last time before it comes out of St. Jude. Right there, Gibson parking lot. Chiska, we talked about that earlier. It's just a beautiful building. The, the southern portion got added in 1961, uh, and it's completely occupied now, I think, too. That's just a very exciting project there. And we are so happy we got to see Lillian Johnson today. It just made my day. Hey. All right, all right. See you next week, I hope, or not. We'll get the sign up. Okay, so I got to go. We got to go. Y'all got to go. You know how to get back? I got to go that way. Oh, thank you. Then I got to go to Memphis Heritage. So thank God.